So, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our lecture series entitled Fit for Fellowship, a survival guide for the first year general cardiology fellow. I'm Megan Palter. I'm Stacey Sai. And we're both uh, almost second year general cardiology fellows at uh, Scripps in La Jolla, California. We wanted to welcome you. And before we get started, we wanted to tell you a little bit about how this boot camp, boot camp came to be. So uh, a year ago, Megan and I were incoming first year fellows and we very quickly realized that there was a steep learning curve. And, and that uh, at the start of fellowship, we were being asked to take care of really clinically complex patients um, despite having very little experience. And so you can imagine um, the first few nights of call when you have your first cardiogenic shock patient come in um, or you know the LVAD alarms are going off and you're asked to troubleshoot. Uh, but it's quite intimidating or even just um, being on your first week of inpatient and managing a VFib arrest on your own. So uh, we thought we could not possibly be the only first year fellows feeling this way. And so we thought, why not create a lecture series that really addresses uh, sort of the sur uh, survival guide, if you will, for the first year fellow to really set him or, or her up for success. We wanted to thank uh, everyone who helped this project come to be. Um, that includes the California ACC board, especially Leanna Kalinj, um, our wonderful CEO, as well as Dr. Jamal Rana, its president, its fantastic president, uh, for their support. We also wanted to thank our speakers. We wouldn't be here without them, um, and they're coming from across all of the California fellowships. So we're very excited to hear um, all of our talented educators um, from across California. We, of course, wanted to thank our own program, um, including our program directors, for their support. And of course, Scripps Institution for financially uh, supporting this project in its entirety. And so what you can come to expect is a, a boot camp of lectures um, that will be occurring weekly on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. And so each week will be a different topic by a different speaker. Um, and we will be covering high yield topics. Um, so this will run including topics like um, cath basics, um, arrhythmias, cardiogenic shock, heart failure, managing MCS, mechanical circulatory support, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, pacemakers, et cetera. So all very high yield topics. Exactly. And each of these sessions will follow the same format. It will be a 30 to 45 minute lecture um, given by one of our speakers and then followed by Q&A uh, soon after. As a reminder, please make sure that you're muted uh, during the course of the lecture um, in itself. And if you do have any questions, feel free to place them in the chat. And then uh, Stacey and I will be moderating it after the lecture is finished. All right, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our very first speaker. It's going to be Dr. Atif Qasim from UCSF. So uh, Dr. Qasim is an Associate Professor of Medicine, at the Division of Cardiology at University of California, San Francisco. He is the Program Director for the General Cardiology Fellowship at UCSF. And he is also the Echo Core Lab Director, as well as the Associate Chief for Education. So Dr. Custom specializes in echocardiography, valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathy, as well as structural interventions. He received his medical degree from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and completed his internal medicine residency and chief residency at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And at the same place, he completed a fellowship in cardiovascular disease and a master's degree in epidemiology. Dr. Kassim is a member of the American Society of Echocardiography, the American Heart Association, and the American College of Cardiology. So without further ado, we'll let Dr. Kassim start. Hi everyone, my name is Adam Kassim. I'm a cardiologist at the University of California, San Francisco. It's my pleasure today to talk to you about echo convergence. Or how many relevant disclosures. My objectives for this talk is by the end for you to be able to describe some specific scenarios where a stat echo was indicated. I want you to be able to understand which echo views and Doppler types are needed for specific stat echo questions. I want you to start to begin to recognize the different LV wall segments in each standard echo. There's some reading prior to this session that would be helpful. Um, you know, it will help for you to have some understanding of the basic echocardiographic views, the parasternals, apicals, and costals in particular. We created a video here, a uh, tutorial that you can use if you want to review those. 
It also helps to have some basic knowledge of different types of Doppler, so pulse wave or PW, continuous wave, CW, Doppler, as well as MO. Um, there's some helpful resources to start to get you on your way. There's some classic textbooks by JKO, Catherine Otto, and uh, Harvey Feigenbaum. Uh, I also have created a website, echocardiographer.org, uh, in which there's a specific section on transthoracic imaging to help get started. So these are some common stat echo indications. Um, there's suspected tamponade, ongoing chest pain when it's not clear if the person is really having acute coronary syndrome. Um, often you'll be asked to, to assess RV function in someone who has a submassive PE. Um, and then, you know, in any case, someone who's quite sick and you're not exactly sure what's going on, that can shock, post cardiac surgery, um, someone with a you know, transplant who's not doing well and you're concerned about rejection. Um, or someone who has hemodynamic collapse and you're concerned about a valve lesion. Um, other indications that we see commonly are, are someone who urgently needs to start chemotherapy and LP function pre is, is needed, as well as, um, you know, someone who uh, is providing a heart for a transplant and you want to assess the function to make sure that, it, that it's uh, an appropriate organ for donation. Um, some questionable stat echo indications. So volume status comes up quite often and nowadays with the uh, prevalence of POCUS, that should be something that can often be answered without a full echo. Um, other indications, so new onset AFib is usually not a stat indication, again, without you know, hemodynamic compromise. Uh, aortic dissection, although the patient may be sick, um, you know, usually trying to make the diagnosis requires additional type of imaging, either a CT, MR, or ideally a TEE if those imaging modalities are not possible. Um, pericarditis, again, is not something that requires a stat echo unless you're concerned, again, about living in a compromise or tamponade. And then murmur, you know, in a stable patient, um, again, middle of the night, you know, coming, coming in to do those echoes. Uh, usually you can have a discussion with the provider and decide, you know, what is the appropriate time frame. So the ones I'm going to focus on for this session, I'm going to in particular focus on tamponade and, and what the protocol uh, you need to follow to, to look at all the features of uh, increased intrapericardial pressure. I will also look at chest pain and review the, the wall segments and, um, and then uh, PE to assess RV function. So those are outlined here. We'll start with the tamponade protocol. And uh, typically, you'll start with the peristernal long axis using a high depth so that you can see a lot of things below the heart. Um, I usually like to have a depth of around 15 or more centimeters. Um, and what you're looking at here, so this is a patient who does have uh, significant pericardial fluid. Um, the landmark structure that helps you identify pericardial fluid from pleural fluid is the descending aorta. And in this case, anything anterior to the descending aorta is pericardial fluid. Anything sort of posterior behind is pleural fluid. So it's a very helpful landmark. Um, and what you're looking for in this view is to see exactly how large the fluid is. If it's circumferential, does it go all the way around the anterior and posterior? Um, as well as additional features um, in terms of what exactly is in the fluid. Is it fairly clear or is it fibrinous? So this is a, a first good view uh, to start to get that uh, assessment. Next, you turn to the peristernal short axis. This is a view from the mid ventricle. Again, you want to assess at all different short axis, you know, the apex, mid ventricle, up near the base. And you will look around to see where the fluid is the greatest. Um, we categorize the size of the pericardial fusion um, just using linear measurements typically. So if it's less than a centimeter, that's considered small. If it's one to two centimeters, the greatest dimension, it's moderate. And if it's more than two centimeters in any one area, it's considered large. Um, in this case, you can actually see there is some fibrinous debris here in the pericardial space, uh, which is otherwise clear. 
suggesting that this effusion is fairly uh, chronic. Then moving on to the apical four chamber, this is one of the best views usually to see both RV and RA chamber collapse and diastole. So RA chamber collapse, usually you're going to see it in late diastole, uh, in towards systole, and the RV chamber collapse is usually an early diastolic phenomenon. Now uh, looking at this, uh, in real time, it may be difficult to see the, uh, the elements of the cardiac cycle and exactly when there is chamber collapse. So I suggest slowing things down. So if we were to slow things down, we focus on the LV. So let's start with the LV. So here the LV, so LV, RV, RA, LA. Here the LV is in systole. Now as it starts to expand, so it's expanding here, 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 you can see that the LV is almost fully expanded, but the RV is still collapsed. So the RV expands a little bit later. Here it comes. So there's early RV diastolic collapse. This is a classic example of that. And then later in diastole, you see the RA invaginates. So it is compressed and it continues, it even continues and it's still compressed as LV systole starts. So here the LV is getting smaller and then finally the RA gets larger. So slowing it down uh, really helps you to assess if you go frame by frame if there's RA and RV chamber collapse. The next thing we like to do in the apical four chamber view is put a PW Doppler cursor at the tips of the tricuspid and mitral valve. And what we're looking for here is, is there inflow variation in, with respiration? So in particular, you know, are there significant changes in flow on the right and left side that are uh, mediated by changes in int intrathoracic pressure and breathing? So what you'll do is you'll put a PW Doppler cursor at the tips of the mitral valve. Remember, PW Doppler measures velocity just at that particular location. And so uh, what you'll usually get is both an E and an A wave, both on the tricuspid and mitral side. And, and what you're going to do, which is different from a typical echo, is you're going to change the sweep speed. So it'll be 25 opposed to imaging, which is around 75 or something at 100. And that way you can do multiple different cardiac cycles. So to acquire this probably took about you know four or five seconds in each one of these uh, you know beats. This person has a heart rate around 97. What you're looking for is uh, changes in the uh, E inflow. So there's an E and an A wave, that second wave, which is you know, the atrial contraction. It's usually right below the P wave that's shown here. Um, so you've got an E and an A. And although a little bit hard to tell here, you can see that there is significant inflow variation um, with, the, with, with breathing. Um, although not shown here, you can put the respirometer on, and so you can uh, use that to assess when the patient is breathing. But in the middle of the night or when you're with the patient, uh, often you can also see that in real time. Uh, this is a little bit less sensitive. The patient doesn't have a regular heart rate or if they're in AFib, and so just use that with caution. The amount that we are looking in terms of E inflow variation is around 40%. So if you measure the, the peak, the highest uh, E to the lowest E, um, we're looking for that difference to be around 40% with respiration. Uh, here's an example on the mitral side, the E and A is a little bit clearer here, um, and we're looking for a variation of about 25%, so a little bit less on the left side than on the right side. Moving on, if you tilt uh, anteriorly from the four chamber to the five chamber view, uh, you'll get the left ventricular outflow tract view, so LV, aortic valve, aorta, LA. And what you can do here is do what's called an echo pulses. So you can put the cursor, the PW cursor, again, PW measures velocity just at that particular location. You can put it in the LVOT and you can see what is the variation in flow going out the, the ventricle with respiration and see that it, in this case, it does actually vary 
you know, a, a fair amount uh, with with respiration. And then for good measure, you want to look at the other apical views to again assess the size and um, the location of the, the effusion and see where it's the largest. You can see that this person has both a plural and pericardial effusion, that it's quite large, uh, at least several centimeters. And wrapping around the apex, the infra wall, and the interior wall. The subcostal view is a good view to look to see if there's adequate clearance for a subcostal tap. And you're usually looking for around a centimeter of clearance in both systole and diastole. And here you can see that this, this patient has a significant pericardial effusion um, that is circumferential, again, with some fibrinous degree. It's also a good place to look for RV and RA collapse, especially if your apical views weren't great. So again, you can slow it down and you can see that the LV here is expanded, but the RV is still collapsed. And then finally, we like to look at the IVC, see if there's significant uh, you know, dilation and lack of collapse suggestive of elevated right-sided pressures. And what you're looking for is whether the IVC is greater than 2.1 centimeters, usually measured after the hepatic vein, which isn't as well seen in this view, but it's right here, probably would enter somewhere around here. Um, and then you're looking for collapse with respiration. Uh, this, this person doesn't really have significant collapse at all. But it's to, to summarize, um, what you want to start out with is that peristernal long axis using high depth. You want to see if you can distinguish you know, pleural versus pericardial fluid. Um, you're then going to look through the different views, the short axis, the apicals. You want to see how much fluid there is around the heart. Is there enough clearance for tap? What is the size? Um, you're going to do the pulse wave Doppler across the mitral intracuspid valve at the leaflet tips, usually the, in the apical four chamber view because that's the best um, lined up with the, with the Doppler. And you can also do the LVOT in the uh, five chamber viewing. And you're looking with a long sweep speed and trying to see is there significant inflow variation. Then finally, you want to check to see if there's collapse of the IVC with respiration or not. Some tips, make sure the ECG leads are on. It's really important to, to help tell um, sometimes what is system, what is the athlete, if the rhythm is regular, and if the inflow variation can be trusted. Um, I showed you how you could, you could slow down and go frame by frame to see if there is significant right-sided chamber collapse. And then some other modalities to consider um, if you're having difficulty slowing things down in time is to do an end mode which basically is the type of Doppler that, that allows you to see structures and distances across time. So it's very good temporal resolution. You can see things that are moving very quickly. So you can put an end mode cursor down in the cursor of a long axis, or often the subcost will be used to assess the chamber collapse. Just to review the chamber collapse, so we said that the RA chamber collapse is at the end of the astral, sometimes into systole. Generally fairly sensitive, but not very specific. Um, if it is more than one third of the cardiac cycle, however, it becomes both sensitive and specific um, for increasing the pericardial pressures. You can have RA collapse for other uh, reasons. So occasionally with a very large right-sided pleural fusion, you can sometimes see RA collapse. Now, RV collapse is usually seen just in early diastole, and it tends to be more specific for increased intracardial pressures. Um, and then LA collapse is quite rare. Um, it, it's uh, fairly specific um, for tamponade. Usually, it's a post-surgical uh, issue. Uh, one caveat is to be aware in someone who has significant right-sided uh, ventricular hypertrophy or pulmonary hypertension, um, that you may not see significant collapse, although they could have physiology uh, consistent with tamponade. Also be aware of hypovolemia. Uh, in, in cases of individuals with hypovolemia, they may have something called low-pressure tamponade, which is a subject for a different talk.
And then finally, uh, you want to make sure that there is inflow variation across the mitral and tricuspid valves. Our cutoffs are around 25% for the mitral, 40% for the tricuspid. And that suggests ventricular interdependence, which you can see with increased intrapericardial pressures. We also talked about the size of the effusion, what, what makes small, moderate, and large uh, in terms of the measurements, and then uh, trying to look to see if there's adequate clearance for a tap. Most commonly, you're going to use a subcostal approach or an apical approach. Um, the characteristics of the fluid, if it's fairly clear, uh, versus if they're fibrin strands or, or masses, if the pericardium is thick, can help you think about what the etiology might be. Um, it's often good to look closely in individuals who have abnormal LVs. Um, if they have signs of a contained rupture, um, that would change management in, in that type of individual. You may not necessarily put in a drain, certainly at the bedside. And then it's important in smaller effusions uh, to help make sure you can distinguish uh, if it's really pericardial, if it's just fat. We talked about distinguishing plural and pericardial fluid. Here's an example of someone who has pericardial fat. Um, and what you can see here are these equigenic sort of globules in the pericardial space. And the characteristic feature is that they move in a stereotypical fashion with the uh, pericardium. So now I'd actually like to go back and show you some additional pathology on that individual that I showed earlier for this case. So and this person uh, also has a uh, descending aortic dissection. You can just see the hints of a flap here in the descending aorta. It already had an ascending aortic repair. There's actually graph material here. Um, and that this individual was on dialysis and it's, had missed uh, several uh, sessions of dialysis and was uremic. Um, and so this individual did end up uh, having hemodynamic, a uh, hemodynamically significant effusion, uh, which was strained. Now we'll move on to the second section where we'll look at uh, assessing wall motion abnormality. Uh, for example, in someone that has chest pain with a concern for ACS. So the echo views for someone with chest pain uh, involve getting as many views of the LV as you can. Ideally, you want to try to zoom in on the LV and the apical views. And if you do see a long motion abnormality, you want to try to confirm it in these two different views. It's also important to assess for other things that you may see as complications of an MI. So you do want to look at valves and valvular function. Um, and as I'll show you, you're not just going to be looking for, for motion or lack of motion or a particular wall segment, but also thickening. Um, you want to be able to try to distinguish whether something is scarred down and thin and echo bright, which suggests that it's old, versus if it's thick or hypertrophied and a kinetic, which suggests that this is probably a new process uh, and system with an, with an ACS. And certainly, if you can't see the wall segments adequately, you should use LV contrast. So it does help to review the wall segments. I have a tutorial posted on YouTube that you can review um, as uh, an initial primer. And then certainly, as you're echoing, you should continue to practice calling out the different wall segments in each view. So at the end of that tutorial, I have uh, this drawing, which basically reviews in each view the LV wall segments. So the peristernal long axis, you're seeing the anteroseptal wall and the infralateral. In the forechamber, you're seeing the septum and lateral wall tilting up towards the aorta. You'll see the anteroseptum and anterolateral, so the anterior portions of the septum and lateral wall. And then tilting or rotating to the two chamber view from the four chamber, you'll see the orthogonal views to the four chambers. So you have the anterior, the inferior wall, the anterior wall. So it's going to be on the right side, on the same side as the appendage. And then rotating further, you'll have again the anteroseptal and infralateral wall in the apical long axis view, which is the same view as the peristernal long axis, except for looking from the apex, you can also see the apical segments. And finally, you have the, the 
the four chamber view um, and the sunk costal, which allows you to see the lateral and sunk walls, so similar to the four chamber uh, in the so I'm going to show you some different patterns of wall motion abnormalities. At the end of the day, you want to really acquire those images. And if you're not sure, certainly have an expert reader uh, review them with you. So here's an example of someone who's having a, an acute LAD infarct. Let's switch here to highlighter. Um, and so what you'll see here uh, are a few things. So uh, in the parasternal long axis, we can see this person has some degree of calcification of the valves. But in terms of wall motion abnormalities, it's really hard to see much. I think it's very subtle, but there's a very distal interoceptal lack of, uh, you know, wall motion in the mid ventricle. Everything looks great. Everything seems to be coming in towards the center without thickening. Then when you get to the apex, uh, it doesn't look like very much is moving. So having fanned through the short axis is very important to, to be able to see that. You don't see that clearly in the peristernal long axis or other short axis views. When you get to the apical views, you can see that basically from mid to distal septum, the apex and kind of this distal lateral wall doesn't seem to be moving well. And then on the two chamber, uh, you can see probably from the mid to distal anterior wall, the apex and just sort of wrapping around the, uh, and the, that there's significant hypokinesis. And then the apical long axis, again, now you can more clearly see that from mid to distal anteroceptive and apex that there is a significant hypokinesis, a lack of thickening. So this is a classic sort of mid to distal LED infarct pattern in having seeing this in multiple different views is very helpful to confirm that it's real. Here's an example of something that's an RCA infarct. Um, so this can be a little bit more subtle. Um, the parasternal long axis, it's hard to, to pick up anything in particular. Um, the parasternal short axis, you get a hint that there's some problem here at the base. So again, this is the inferior wall. Um, this would be the septum, anterior, lateral. When you get to the mid wall, though, it's much more clear. So the RV is inserting here. So this is the inferior wall. You can see that it's uh, not thinned out, but uh, it is not contracting. So if you just follow this cursor and look at what segments are coming towards the cursor, towards the center, so maybe the anterior septum is the anterior wall, that the inferior and infralateral wall. Are, are not moving uh, adequately. The four chamber view, the lateral wall looks okay, the apex looks okay. A bit hard to make out what's going on in the basal septum, which is often supplied by the RCA, it doesn't look to be thickening adequately. And then on the two chamber view, and again, this can be subtle, but um, having multiple views is certainly helpful. You see that this basal inferior wall is really not uh, thickening and, and moving um, the way it should. One other clue is that the base here, often there's a, a descent in the base towards the apex, and that seems not to be moving well. And finally, on this apical long axis, the basal inferior lateral wall is a little bit better seen. It doesn't appear to be moving. So this is someone who has had an RCA infarct um, or is actively having an RCA infarct, and I think um, you know, the wall motion abnormality when looking across multiple uh, views is very clear. This is a circumflex infarct pattern. So um, the circumflex gets the infralateral and lateral walls, uh, depending on the anatomy. And so here in the personal long axis, you see that this basal infralateral wall doesn't appear to be moving well. It's not thickening like the uh, like the anteroceptum. Um, here in the uh, short axis at the mitral, it's hard to, to make much. Um, a little bit hard to tell if there's wall motion, but certainly when you get to the mid uh, views, you can see here that this infralateral wall really is not thickening at all. It looks a little bit thin, um, suggesting this may be more subacute. Uh, the apical four chamber, the lateral wall here actually looks okay. Um, it looks to be thickening well. The anterior wall and infra wall look okay, but again, on the uh, apical long axis, you can see that the basal to mid infralateral wall is really hypokinetic and somewhat thinned out. So this person 
actually had a, a occlusion of, of one of their OMs that affected the intro level. Here's an example of someone who's had a chronic infarct, um, and you can see signs that the uh, myocardium is echo bright and thin in, in these apical four chamber view, the basal to mid septum, and in the two chamber, the basal to mid infer wall suggested, su suggesting a uh, chronic uh, right coronary occlusion. All right, now I'd like to move on to echo in PE. So is echo useful in PE? Certainly it should be used to help make the diagnosis. We have other modalities for that, but it can be helpful to assess the RV and RV function in someone who's had a submassive PE. Um, RV dysfunction is associated with increased mortality in these patients. And certainly Linux may be useful in those certainly with massive PE, you know, individuals who are hypotensive, but I uh, have some questionable use of those in submats of PE. And so depending on your institution, if you have uh, groups that are interested in catheter-based therapeutics and uh, you know, for that it's helpful to assess the RV function, uh, you may get asked to, to do an echo. I, I'm, and I'm presenting this one because often there's some modified views that you would need to help look at the RV, uh, different from the standard protocol. And so Certainly any of this, the standard views you use to assess the RV, um, you know, the apical four, the subcostal, the short axis, but there's a modified apical four chamber view where you tilt over to try to get more of the RV and that's helpful in, in these particular cases. Um, you can also try to look at the PA bifurcation in the short axis, which is a view that uh, sometimes you can get. Um, you can see how dilated the, the pulmonary artery is, for example, and in rare cases may see a, a, a thrombus in that location. Uh, certainly you want to look at the RV for pressure and volume overload. Uh, you want to measure the, the PA pressure in multiple views. Um, often if the PA pressure is significantly elevated over 50 or 60, that suggests at least that there is uh, some component of a, a chronic process because it's difficult to get a PA pressure that high acutely. Uh, and for the individual if it's still have an RV that, that has some function. Um, and then certainly if you can't see the RV very well, you can consider contrast. And in this case, you can actually use saline contrast. Um, so we just uh, inject some um, micro saline bubbles uh, to pacify the RV. And here's an example of someone who's had a significant uh, PE that showered to um, you know, both uh, PAs, the branch PAs. So you can see that there and here. And often the CT will also give some comment about the RV, although it's somewhat limited, but um, you know, depending on the view they get, they can tell you that the RV looks like it's fairly large. Again, the echo is going to tell you a little bit more about the RV function um, and, uh, and the size. So here's an example of someone with an acute PE. This person's images were actually obtained while they were sitting upright because they were so dyspneic. So in the parasternal long axis view, um, you can see the LV function looks good. A little bit hard to see. This is actually the RV outflow track, uh, not the RV proper. And uh, you get the hint that there may be something going on here. Uh, when you get to the short axis views, however, now you can start to see that the RV is somewhat enlarged. And when we talk about pressure and volume overload, what we're looking at is we're looking to see whether the septum is flattened or D-shaped. So if it's flat uh, and the, the LD cannot really form or look like a pure circle, that's occurring in diastole only, we call that volume overload. If it's occurring in systole only, we call that pressure overload. If it occurs in both systole and diastole, we call it pressure and volume overload. And here what you can see is that primarily it's in diastole. During systole, um, Although it is still a little bit flat, the LD does uh, you know, make it look like it's more of a circle. Uh, this is an apical four chamber view, which really just shows you how large the RV is, um, and uh, you know, certainly in relation to the LD, uh, as well as the RA. And then this is that apical four chamber view that's RV focused. So uh, you want to tilt over 
and try to see if you can get the RV apex in base. And we can see that the RV is quite dysfunctional. And there's a measure called fractional area change where you can measure the area in diastole and systole and see if it's significantly smaller. And in here, it doesn't appear to be. And then you know, looking at the apical segments, um, that seems to be the only area where the RV has some degree of uh, contraction. So this is the so-called maternal sign. Um, but a very large dysfunctional uh, RV with some signs of pressure and volume overload. There are some other uh, important measures to look at RV function in these individuals. Um, and so the first is the TAPSI or the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. So you're going to use the end of the cursor and put it over the tricuspid annulus, and you're going to look to see how much that annulus is moving from base to apex. And we usually like to see that it's uh, over uh, one point, uh, greater than or equal to 1.7 centimeters. Similarly, you can use tissue doppler that measures the velocity of tissue, the annulus, and we like to see in systole that that value is over 10. Here it's 13. Um, these measures are useful, uh, you know, assessments of uh, right-sided function, although have to be taken a little bit with a grain of salt when the RV is very large and it takes very little motion of the RV uh, to generate, uh, you know, these numbers. And then certainly you want to look at the, the TR jet in this case, um, you know, the PA pressure is assessed from the TR jet using the Bernoulli, simplified Bernoulli equation of 4B squared um, is only around 30. Um, and then you want to look to see what the IVC looks like. Um, and in this case, it's dilated and it's not collapsing. Oh, yes, fine. Um, this is a view that uh, we were able to obtain in the same patient uh, looking at the uh, PA. And what you can actually see here is, so here's the aorta, here's the main PA. You can actually see that there is some kind of layered thrombus here in the, the branch PA um, on the left. And so uh, that was, uh, you know, something that you don't always see, but certainly you should be on the lookout for in someone who you're assessing uh, for PE. So I'll stop there with those three cases and just provide some take-home points. So. Just remember as a you know new fellow, you know, a lot of the static requests you get are usually requests for help. So it's helpful to have them focus on a particular question so you can direct uh, you know your echo uh, to get those additional views that you may need uh, for a particular question. Um, you should certainly make sure you try to answer that question uh, in addition to doing as much of a complete echo as you can. Um, and then if possible, try to look at the old echo images. Um, certainly it's very helpful going in to see what kind of views you might get um, or can get. Uh, and, and certainly looking at those images uh, before you go scanning, uh, if, if possible, it can be helpful for you to figure out you know, what, what type of views you might be, be get. Um, you know, I think one thing we usually teach is that the echo exam is fluid and so you know, it can change based on what you see. So, for example, if you're assessing someone with wall motion and looks chronic, um, you would probably, you know, if say they have a wall motion at the apex, you want to maybe go off axis and look and see if they have an LV thrombus. So, you know, there's some additional things you, you might or might not do based on, on what you see and um, what you're looking to find. Uh, it's important to make sure you try to get familiar with all of the different machines and, uh, you know, try to scan with the same protocol for each. Um, as we reviewed, you know, you should know the different doctor modalities, PWCW, you should know what you need to do for particular questions. So for tamponade, for example, you need that long sweep at 25 to get multiple cardiac cycles to do the PW across the tricuspid and mitral valves. Um, I think it's important if you know the wall segments, and certainly for assessing coronary disease, and then you can see if there's something wrong in more than one view. Certainly, that takes some time as you're learning, and so it's often helpful as you get those, uh, you know, initial views to make sure you, you use your backup, whether that's, you know, a more senior fellow who's on with you or an attending to view the images uh, in real time 
uh, you know, to help assess if you've gotten everything adequately uh, to answer the question. So we'll end it there, and I wish you all the best of luck, and, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, an excellent lecture, um, fantastic, and very important and very useful um, in our uh, daily lives as cardiology fellows. Now, we'll be entering the Q&A section of our uh, session today, um, like I wrote in the chat, or we wrote in the chat. If you do have any questions, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat box and uh, send them to us privately or um, to everybody in general. I think to start, um, something that come, uh, has been coming up is really uh, identifying the, the different LV walls, the different segments. Um, so if Dr. Kassin, if you're, if you're there, if you could unmute yourself, um, if you could go over that some more, that would be really helpful. Yeah, sure. So I um, sent a link to the video on YouTube so you guys can take a look at that, but it's helpful for me to maybe go over that briefly. Um, what I can do is share my screen if you guys let me. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's see. That would it help if I if we pulled up the, the link that you sent? Whichever you do that, or you could just stop share and then I can share my screen if that's easier. Okay. There you go. All right. So you guys can all see uh, peristernal short axis views. So um, you know, one way to teach this, and I, I really don't like memorizing stuff. I, um, you know, want to find a way for people to understand things so that they can sort of remember it. I think it's easier if you understand it from the peristernal short axis view. So the short axis is cutting the ventricle like it's slices of bread. Um, and so, you know, we typically cut the ventricle up at the, the top, the base, where the mitral valve is. We cut it usually, you know, somewhere in the middle. Um, the mid ventricle, and then we cut it around the apex. And, you know, this creates different segments. And so I want to just go over kind of how we think about those segments. So um, the way, and I mentioned this, the way we define the septum is where the RV inserts. So here's the RV, here's the LV. And so the RV inserts here and here. And so this defines the septum. And, you know, you may be imaging and the RV is on top and the LV is on the bottom. And so things are qu quite turned around in some patients. And so if you can identify where the RV inserts, you can easily identify the septum. So if that's the septum, then, you know, just uh, on the top of that, this would be the anterior wall. Across from the septum would be the lateral wall. And then on the bottom would be the inferior wall. So those are the four main you know, walls that we think of. And then the, the segments in between are sort of, um, you know, just the combination of the names. So this would be anteroseptum, this would be anterolateral, this would be um, infralateral, inferior and lateral, and this would be infraseptum. And so you have those segments at the base and at the mid wall. And then at the apex, we sort of forget those diagonal segments and just use you know, apical, anterior, inferior, uh, septal, and lateral. And so that's what's shown here on the next slide. Um, there are actually 17 segments because the apex has its own segments. So you have uh, a total of 17 there. Now, the next thing to understand to try to figure out, you know, what the segments are in each of the views is just to understand how you're cutting through the ventricle. So the peristernal long axis, uh, remember, you know, you're cutting, you're holding the probe like this, and it's, um, you know, oriented to um, mirror view uh, at uh, 10 o'clock towards your uh, right shoulder. So you're cutting like this. Looks like we're getting a little bit of feedback. Um, so you're cutting through the short axis in this view. So you'll be anteroseptal and infralateral. And that's exactly the segments that you see. If you go to the apical four chamber, and so that's you know down here at the apex, um, you're cutting the ventricle like this. And so on the short axis image, the, the cut line is like this. So you should see the septal and lateral wall. That looks like that. And then as you start to scan, you'll know, you know what you do to go from a four chamber to a five chamber. Uh, the five chamber just includes the, the aorta um, and the aortic valve. And so what ends up happening to get that, the aorta is an anterior structure. So you're just going to tilt anteriorly. So um, 
it just moves that line up on the short axis. So we're getting the anteroseptum and anterolateral wall. Okay. And then a two chamber view. So it's not a view you may be comfortable with because it's not one that we use in POCUS. So it's one of those extra views. Um, to get the two chamber view, again, there's another tutorial on this. You just uh, rotate the, the, the probe 90 degrees. So it's at 12 o'clock. So we're cutting orthogonally through the ventricle. And so it looks like this, since you're actually cutting through the anterior and inferior. So it just goes to show you with POCUS, if you're looking for wall motion, um, you know, you're looking at just the four chamber, the short axis, the parasternal long, you're not going to get all the wall segments. So it is important to learn all of the different views that you're going to need, especially if you're looking for, say, an anterior MI. So that gives you the anterior and inferior wall. And then you rotate a little bit more um, for the apical long axis. And that again gives you the anteroseptum and intralateral wall. And this is the exact same cut as the um, parasternal long axis, except instead of cutting from here, starting the probe up here and looking down, you're actually looking from the apex. And so that's what it looks like. And so, um, you know, the I guess the last view, the subcostal long axis, so you, you, um, you know, may be comfortable with, with that view from uh, POCUS, uh, also called the, the four chamber view, depending on whether you get the, the aortic valve in view or not. Um, but basically your sub xiphoid, and you should be able to see the RV and the LV. And again, it's very similar to the subcostal or for the, to the four chamber view. Um, and you should be getting the septum and lateral wall. If you happen to tilt up and see the aortic valve down here, then it's the anteroseptum and anterolateral. So this is kind of a summary. If, if there was any slide to kind of think about wall motion, if you can conceptualize this in your mind and just think about how you're cutting through with each view, um, this will help you learn the wall motion. And I don't expect anyone, certainly not you know, any of our fellows to learn this on day one. This is something that you review again and again. And as you start um, you know, to scan, scanning is very important. As you start to scan and learn the views, if you start to call out and think about what those segments are, it'll help you uh, start to remember them and it just becomes easier by practice. So that's just a very quick overview. Hopefully you'll have some time to review that and digest it a little bit more. Okay, do we have any other questions before we move on to a, a different topic? Just in case anyone wanted to mute themselves. And, okay, I think we might get. So uh, Dr. Carson, the other thing that came up is really um, with, um, with Champanod looking at the LV and the RV um, just the, the D septum and also looking at kind of RV collapse and RA collapse that you've talked about. If you don't mind uh, going over that, that portion uh, again, I think um, especially trying to see if the collapse is during diastole versus systole, I think that kind of sort of subtlety. Okay, let me pull that up again. So um, I will share my screen. Just give me a second here. Okay, you guys can all see this again. Yes. Um, so yeah, and and again, you guys will have this hopefully up on uh, you know on YouTube. You can play this again and again and, and see exactly what we're talking about. But um, I think if I just were to play it in real time, I mean, I think you can visualize and see that the RV is not fully expanding. And this is a pretty extreme example. Um, and you can see that the RV is sort of the RA is invaginating. So we know there's something wrong there but you wanna sort of categorize where is it happening in the cardiac cycle. And so uh, what you can do, so I usually like to slow it down on 2D. So here's, I just happened to pick a great, a great spot. Um, you can see that the LV has started to expand, right? So how do we define systole and diastole? When the LV is getting smaller, that's systole, as it starts to get bigger, it's diastole. And so let me take you back to the beginning. So here is systole, the LV is getting smaller, right? Smaller, smaller, smaller. Now here's gonna be the first frame of diastole. Here's the second frame of diastole, third frame, the RV is still pretty small and squished. Fourth frame, look how big that LV has gotten. Fifth frame, now the RV is like, oh, 
I, I better start doing something. Uh, sixth frame, seventh frame, eighth frame. And that's a lot of time that the RV is, is, is fairly smushed. So early diastolic collapse of the RV is seen here. So that's one way to do it. And all of the echo machines will allow you to go frame by frame. You can freeze them. There's a cine mode and, and you can do that. And then with the RA, so diastole is still occurring because the LV is still getting bigger. Systole hasn't started yet. And so, and I'm, and I'm using this method of looking at the LV because sometimes you may not have a reliable ECG or you can't tell where the QRS is, um, but you can all see that the, L, that the RA is invaginated. Like I ran to the end of the clip, so let's, let's do that first correct exactly. So here it's uh, invaginated, invaginated the RA right here. And then as I keep going, systole starts. See, the LV is starting to squeeze. It's starting to get a little bit smaller. The RA is still a little bit invaginated, at least a couple frames in, and still going. And now it, it opens. So I would say this is late diastolic collapse into early systole of the RV. That sort of help or clarify things. Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Um, excellent points. Excellent presentation for sure. Um, one thing that did come up is um, the low pressure tamponade, which you um, had discussed previously, um, and it's not something that um, I've I've seen in um, my one year here, but it's something that is definitely very important not to miss. How often do you, um, does this occur, and um, how uh, how often should you be looking for it? It's not that common. I mean, there aren't actually a, a ton of descriptions of it. There's one study that I think looked at around 270 patients that they at, at their center with tamponade, and it was you know certainly the minority, overwhelming minority, and it's it's a hard diagnosis to make. Um, basically, you have what looks like you know tamponade physiology, at least in terms of Know, collapse of the chambers, but at an RA pressure that isn't high. So I think it's it's better instead of focusing on low pressure tamponade to just think about broadly what are the scenarios where some of these findings, um, you know, uh, you, you may not see some of these findings. And so, you know, I think RV and RA collapse, a lot of us focus on that quite a bit. That's sort of the one of the echo features that you see, but you can have tamponade without RA or RV collapse. And one of the you know, settings we see that is when the right-sided filling pressures are really high. So people with significant pulmonary hypertension, RVH, you may not see that. And, and those patients do get, um, you know, pericardial effusions and they can have tamponade physiology. Um, there are other scenarios where you will get inflow variation across the mitral and tricuspid valve uh, where, um, you know, the patient may not be in tamponade. So I, I certainly mentioned, you know, on the right side, the tricuspid you can see inflow variation, meaning that the flow across the tricuspid valve changes significantly when you breathe. Uh, you know, people with advanced COPD generating a large, uh, you know, intrathoracic pressure, you can certainly see it in, in that scenario. Um, and then large uh, pleural effusions is another very common one, um, you know, as you're trying to figure out what to do. And so in that case, you might drain the, the pleural effusion, for example. So no one finding, you know, in and of itself, as I think I might have mentioned in the, in the chat, is is going to, you know, clinch a diagnosis of, of tamponade. It's really a, a clinical diagnosis. You want to kind of put all the features together. That that one finding of, as I mentioned, kind of if that, there is collapse throughout diastole and systole, that tends to be more sensitive and specific for increased intrapericardial pressures. Um, but again, tamponade is, is a clinical diagnosis. So you want to know what else is going on with the patient. You want to know their history. Um, if you have an old echo, certainly that's that's very helpful. Um, but you want to try to put all of those things together, not just rely on one piece of information. Fantastic. Um, so one of the questions that came up is if you could talk a little bit about M mode, what, uh, what that is, and also how that's helpful specifically for tamponade. Yeah, so it can be helpful for tamponade. Um, let me see if I can go back here. Let me share my screen again. So I didn't show any examples of that. Um, but M mode echo is basically one of the first forms of echo that we had where we weren't generating 2D images, but we were basically looking at one line of echo interrogation and we're following it over time to see what changes or what would happen. And so 
It has very high, as you guys will come to learn, temporal resolution. It can see things moving very quickly because the echo machine, instead of as it generates a 2D image, it sends one line, listens, one line, listens, one line, listens, and does that 256 times. It does it very fast, so it makes a full image. But it's, it's here making 35 of these basically in one second, 35 images in a second, so you can see moving clips. Whereas MMO just you know, shoots down one line and you can see how it's, um, uh, you can see stuff moving very fast. It's over a thousand, um, you know, lines per second. And so in this view, for example, if you wanted to see if there was significant, um, in this case, RVOT collapse, you could put an MO cursor down and look to see what's happening to the LV and RV. In practice, I would say that our 2D images are usually quite good and the frame rates are also quite good. And I know M mode is something that um, is tested certainly on the boards, but in the middle of the night, if you're trying to decide if there's collapse, I would urge you to just get a good 2D image with um, a fairly good frame rate, which is usually at least 16, ideally kind of over 30 for a 2D without color, and just slow it down and look to see what's happening. I think that's probably you know, at least from, a, from my training, what I remember trying to figure out what's what on an M mode, which is not a modality we use that much, probably going to be a little bit more helpful. Fantastic. Um, and another question that came up um, was whether you could review the cardiac cycle for pressure and volume overload for the D-shaped septum. Let's take a look at that. We definitely talk about pressure and volume overload. This was with the, let me just find the slide here. This is with the RV case. So, I mean, you'll do a lot of echoes in patients who have, um, you know, significant RV dysfunction. And I think um, certainly the rest of what's going on with them is really helpful. Are they really volume overloaded? What's the IVC, the JVP? What is the RV function? So let me play this again. So I think the way that we usually conceptualize pressure and volume overload. So if you look here, um, you know, in a normal patient, what you should see is you should see a circular left ventricle throughout the cardiac cycle. Okay, as the RV um, starts to interact with the LV, so here's a, a nice place right here, you can sort of see that the septum has flattened. Okay, there may be, uh, you know, certainly other examples where it's a little bit more obvious, but the septum has started to flatten out, and that's in diastole. And usually early diastolic um, flattening is what you'll often see in people with RV dysfunction. If the flattening occurs throughout diastole, diastole is a relatively low pressure state from the LV side, we consider that to be volume overload. And systole, as the pressure in the LV goes up, usually the LV forms a circle again, right? So it's fighting with the, with the RV. Um, and here you can see it is actually more of a circle. So, but if in systole you continue to see flattening, that suggests that the RV is generating enough pressure in systole to kind of overpower the LV for control of that septum. And so that's why we call it uh, pressure overload. So those are patients who often have very high right-sided pressures, uh, systolic pressure. I think that's all the time we have for questions. I wanted to, again, say thank you to Dr. Kassim for taking the time to you know, create this lecture for us, come and answer our questions, and just all the, all the time and effort and support you've put into this. Um, thank you so much. Um, you know, the, the talk itself uh, is recorded and will be available. Um, so uh, you can look for that shortly on the um, California ACC website. And then the additional speakers, um, the topics, the dates, those will also be posted shortly on the website. So look out for that. Yes, again, it was a fantastic uh, presentation and a great start to our um, uh, sessions here. Uh, next week, uh, we'll be joined by Dr. A.J. Baeta um, of the University of Southern California, and he'll be going over an introduction to heart failure. So definitely also a very exciting and important topic, and we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Take care.